Welcome everyone. My name is Shannon Carter and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations Team. Thank you for joining us today for our series, This is Kellogg, Spotlight or Venture Capital with Woody Marshall. The This is Kellogg series provides a showcase to showcase the breadth of Kellogg thought leadership and initiatives important to the future of the school. The ninth series of This is Kellogg focuses on the topic of venture capital. This is the first event of the series and it will be followed by a faculty thought leadership panel in May and an alumni panel in June. Previous areas highlighted in the series include artificial intelligence, private equity, entrepreneurship, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and women leaders. You can catch up on those prior webinars in this series at our virtual events page on the Kellogg Alumni website. We'll drop a link to that site into the chat right now. Today's presentation will last about an hour and we encourage you to submit any questions you have for our speaker at any time via the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen and we'll address audience questions throughout the conversation. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Dean Francesca Cornelli to start our program. Hello everyone. I am uh, so glad to start uh, this uh, spotlight on venture capital. We have so many students applying all focused in having a career in venture capitals or entrepreneurs in startup in this side. So we are developing more and more experiential uh, um, uh, courses or courses on the, on the topic and uh, so I'm delighted to be here and to welcome an alum Woody Marshall who has been so successful in this area and uh, can tell us uh, more. Now Woody has uh, been uh, uh, with uh, technolo Technology Crossover Ventures at TCV since 2008. He focuses on fintech internet, digital media, entertainment industries. So everything everybody wants to invest or follow these days. He's been recognized by Forbes on the Midas list as one of the of the country's uh, uh, industry's top uh, invest technology investors. And, he's, and he serves on several board of directors like GoFundMe and Spotify. He's invested in Netflix, Nubank and Peloton and before Airbnb, Dollar Shave Club, Green Dot, Groupon, HomeAway. I mean, even I know all these, uh, all, all these investments, uh, which means we are, really, we are really at the center of it and the base is successful. So welcome, uh, Woody. Thank you for coming uh, today. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. So I have a lot of questions and I will expect a lot of questions of the audience. So, but let me start, right? You started in venture capital investing since 95. How did you choose to become a venture capital? Did Kellogg has any role in it? it um, I'd love to tell you it was a plan. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when I got out of college, I did a, you know, a bank training program. You know, I, I learned that I was, you know, the, the classic financial analyst, you know, getting pounded on late nights, you know, building models. Um, uh, you know, I worked for another, you know, investor in that, you know, in that, you know, kind of um, uh, that kind of style. And one of the things when I was, um, you know, working on a lot of projects, I was, you know, we would finish a transaction, you know, somebody would buy something, you'd make an investment. And then as a junior person, you were off to the next project. And I was always really interested in, hey, we laid out all these strategies that was, you know, growth initiatives that was part of the, you know, the rationale for the numbers that, you know, that we we're either investing behind or, you know, convincing lenders that they should lend against. But then I, I had no follow through. And um, that was, you know, to me, that was a little frustrating because that was, that seemed like a really interesting part. Um, I realized, you know, by doing some research, that's a lot of that was what you would call marketing, right? And um, yes. at the time, uh, you know, Kellogg was, was, you know, still one of the top marketing schools. So I applied to business school. I got to Kellogg. The thing that I had realized was I didn't want to go work for a big company. I did that right out of college. I, I thought that was um, soul crushing for me. Um, and but, 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 you know, this was 94, you know, you didn't have the internet, you know, you couldn't just log on to your computer and figure out, oh, what are all the cool companies that were there? So I was trying to figure out, 
how to, um, you know, how could I, you know, understand the landscape that was out there because I re really wanted to go work for a company. And um, part of the way through my first year of uh, business school, I got introduced to actually a University of Chicago graduate. Um, uh, I got introduced to him actually at a, a talk at Kellogg. Um, he was the father of one of my classmates and he had just started a venture firm and they were Chicago and, and San Francisco. Uh, it was a firm called Trident Capital. Um, I started reading plans for him you know, during my first year, um, like April of my first year, and I, I left 13 years later. Um, so it certainly scratched my itch for wanting to get really involved in companies. But, you know, the, the, the point is, is I get calls all the time, like, how do you plan for this? This, this was this was not a plan. This was just, you know, a, a total, you know, random opportunity that I that I was able to take advantage of. And by the way, you know, in, I graduated in 96, I think, you know, half of my class and most of my friends, everybody moved west. I was, I commuted to the west a lot. I was in Chicago. There was not a really defined tech, you know, um, ecosystem in Chicago. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling to the coasts, but, you know, the, it was not like if you had drawn out, here's the plan, you know, Oh, well, venture capital is in either Boston or or San Francisco. You're going to go to one of those areas. I just found an opportunity and kind of stuck with it. And um, you know, I guess the rest is history. But it, it it was it was also a really opportune time because you know when I graduated, that was when the internet was getting commercialized. It was it was kind of hard not to be in the middle of some really interesting and exciting things. And that's a great uh, message. Oh. That's a great message also because as, as you were saying, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the time now, right? There's disruption, but disruption brings amazing opportunity and the ability to go with the opportunity is great. But as you say, you know, since, not, since the mid nineties, there's been an incredible change in the landscapes, I think. And you're in the, you know, invested in digital startups. I mean, so much. So. What has changed in digital start or everything else? Almost everything, I guess. <laughs> everything, literally everything's changed. I mean, you know, the early days, you know, some of the things were, um, well, first of all, there was no infrastructure, so you had to do it yourself. I mean, you, you had companies that were, were designing, you know, their own security software. Um, you know, everything was hosted internally. Like the, the time that it would take to start and you know, and get up to scale, um, you know, was you know took a while, and and it was expensive. You also, you know, it wasn't like you could go find executives that had been there, done that before, in similar situations. So you were repurposing folks that had worked in tech, mostly larger tech, and trying to get them to kind of scale down into the startup or emerging growth area. So you know, th there were definitely. Um, you know, lots of things that you had to get right. You know, one of the issues, though, in most any area was, you know, there, A, there wasn't a market, there weren't competitors, but you had to figure out how you were going to, you know, create some of these markets. So, you know, there was there was some of it that was, you know, uh, it, it was great, you know, when you look at it, because you didn't worry about like, oh, Facebook or Amazon's going to, you know, come eat my lunch. But a lot of it you had to, you know, kind of do on your own. It wasn't pattern recognition. It wasn't, hey, here are all the execs that have been there, done that before, and you just, you know, follow their, you know, their recipe. But, um, you know, again, I, I think today is as exciting in terms of, you know, the opportunities as it was, you know, back then. Um, some of them are just, a, you know, a little bit different and maybe more nuanced. There's so many questions uh, already. There, there, let me check one. this one. It says, hi, Woody. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. What strategies or principle did you learn at Kellogg that you have applied to your venture capital investments? Ah. It's, I mean, it's a, good, it's a good question. You know, I mean, to me, I think a, a lot of it was, around, you know, first of all, it's around, you know, the critical thinking. Um, trying to understand what a good business is. I mean, look in the early days, you know, you would use your, you know, Michael Porter analysis, like, you know, 
is that you know what what makes a good company, right? You know, you know, for me, it's pretty simple. It's you know, is it an interesting enough market? You know, big enough yes. market? It, you know, do you have a differentiated product? So here's where you know a lot of the marketing stuff at Kellogg I think was helpful, which was trying to understand. You know, the, you know, I I took you know a, a, when I was a second year. Um, it was the first year that Professor Sani had had taken the new products class and did it in the technology, you know, um, construct, which I think is a mainstay now. But you know, a lot of these lessons and how you were thinking about it, it 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 literally is just helping you with a structured way of approaching a problem, like good market, differentiated product. You know, management's a really important one. You know, I remember before I went to Kellogg, um, I had a family friend who uh, had been a vice chairman of General Electric, actually when, when GE was an important company and, and, and they were renowned for, you know, really solid, um, you know, in, employee development and executive development. And he said to me, you know, you're going to do all this finance and the marketing stuff, but like take, take the, you know, the organizational behavior because, the, you know, those are the things, the intangibles that actually you know, define success in companies, leadership, um, uh, you know, organizational design, you know, communication, negotiations, all, all of these things. Um, so th there were a lot of things that you kind of fall back on, but they weren't, you know, it wasn't like Kellogg was a vocational school where you knew exactly what to do. It was more of a structured framework, you know, kind of like when you read a case for the first time and you have to identify what the problem is and what you're going to do. Because in many cases, there's there's a lot of different ways to answer the question, but I think you just need a structured framework, you know, that works for you. I, I, I love you, Rancia. This is really like why business, how business school can remain relevant as yep. the market changes. But let me ask you also a bit more. I mean, I, I'm, I'm being inundated with questions, but I want to ask you a few more of, uh, of my own and then get there. One is, uh, you, you know, really during the pandemic, really you're, you're focused on digital goods and services. It exploded. There have been a lot of changes. Is the market that market still in flux, so you see the the dust the settle? What's happening there? Yeah, I mean, by the way, it's a good question, and you know, I would say, yeah, the market's in flux. It, it, it you know, it may not be, you know, some of it is the hangover from COVID, but if you go back and look in COVID, we we had some companies that you know we have a you know a, a online ticketing business that does live events. We had a bunch of companies in travel companies in education, like some of these things, like, like, we're not talking about declines in business, we're talking about business stopping, right? So yes. the first thing is you had some companies that literally had to, you know, take remarkably drastic action. Then on the other side, you had companies that all of a sudden, you know, they were riding the like a tidal wave. And, you know, they were trying to keep up as fast as they, you know, as they could totally stretched on, um, you know, you know, their tech infrastructure, their uh, organizational resources. So you had literally two different plays that were that were being run, you know, in companies, some were removing 50% of the heads, you know, dealing with, you know, the, you know, the PPP loans, and then the Main Street loans, you know, uh, you know, if you had, you know, financial commitments, how you were restructuring those, like, you were in survival mode. And then you had other companies that literally were scaling as quickly as they could. Now, the world's changed, right? So now, now you, you do the unwinding. And it's interesting, you know, I think I, I was looking at the data the other day, I think 100% of our companies that benefited from COVID have done some sort of, you know, operational optimization. You know, let, let's use that as the as a euphemism for everything from, you know, infrastructure cuts to, you know, to, to people cuts, um, you know, everybody has, you know, it was, you know, it was a significant hangover. And I think many of those companies, you know, have tried to get back to a more efficient, you know, way of, of you know, of operating. Meanwhile, a lot of the companies that, you know, had to cut um, significantly, most of those businesses grew a little more sensibly, you know, on the way, on the way out. But, you know, it's a little bit of a, 
sine wave, you know, for some of them, you know, uh, you know, travel is a perfect example, you know, parts of travel, like we're Airbnb investors, we're home runs during the, you know, the business, you know, still the business is, is solid, traditional hotels and, you know, and, and air, you know, went through the floor, then you had the return to, you know, travel, not, not as much on the business side, you saw, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a revisiting of, of, you know, some of the, the prior demand trends, but now because of the economy, because of, um, you know, inflation, you have areas where the consumer is pulling back, right? By the way, I see that in the, you know, the ticketing space, any, anybody, you know, for events like 2022, I think will be peak, you know, live concert year because all of the artists that make a ton of money on and in person, uh, you know, events, everybody, you know, did as many as they could last year. So there's there's still you know some unwinding to go. By the way, you, you see it now if you remember Omnicom, I think popped in you know the first quarter of 22. So you actually see some companies today that when you're looking at numbers, they're like, well, remember last year was a tough comp if you were a, a COVID beneficiary. So I, I think, you know, there, there's, depending on where you were, you had a different, you know, it was a different impact. I think everybody now has gone through some form of, wow, there was remarkable growth on a relative basis to, you know, a, a resetting of expectations on the downside. And everybody's had to take a look at being more efficient if, uh, if it was, during COVID when you're forced to do it really quickly or now when you're forced because you're not really totally sure what your demand curve looks like. And oh, by the way, the, the private and public markets have now said, I don't want growth at all costs. I want growth and profitability and I, I want it. I want it now. So, you know, it, I think it was great. And, and, and I certainly got to see a lot of management teams, you know, at their best to make really, really hard decisions, um, you know, do it with, conviction, do it with empathy, um, you know, but we're, we're, we're certainly not out of, you know, now it's a different set of woods, but, you know, we're not out of the woods. You know, it's not like people have full clarity on what's happening with, um, you know, with their business, with their consumers, whether it's, a, you know, your, your end customer as an individual consumer or a, or a business. So I, I think there's still, there's still a lot of uncertainty and, and, um, but I do think, more, you know, companies are probably better equipped to handle that because they've had they've had some tests lately. You you clearly had a, a special view on what is happening and talking about what happening. Like for like, what opportunities in fintech are exciting to you now? For example. Yeah. So, um, so so first of all, when you think about like you know, and, and the way that we approach the world is you think about things thematically, and um, if you just think about the access to you know, you know, basic financial services, which we take for granted in the U.S. because the incumbent banks, the big banks in the U.S., actually do a pretty good job of that. In a lot of um, other markets, that's not the case. You know, it, they're expensive. You know, if you're a, a newer customer, you know, think of you know, people talk about thin file, so your credit file. You don't have a lot of history it's really hard to access those things. So we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about um, opportunities around, you know, financial incl inclusion. Um, uh, and we've done a bunch internationally, because as I said, internationally, you know, I think the competitive dynamic has been a lot more interesting. Um, New Bank has been a, you know, a, a, you know, is this very successful um, investment for us thus far? You know, I, I think it's in the early stages. Um, you know, this again is, Leveraging technology to build a better product, you know, that's very cost effective, and leveraging technology in such a way that you're, you know, you know, kind of um, attacking some of the, uh, you know, some of the limitations of the, you know, incumbent banking market, right? You have a, you know, more personalized, better, you know, tech stack, better user interface, better ability to, you know, um, in, you know, uh, deploy a new products quickly. You don't have legacy tech. You don't have real estate branches. You know, hundreds of thousands of people. Like th those are significant opportunities. So we've we've done things like that. You know, as I mentioned, New Bank in Brazil. We invested in Revolut in in Europe. Uh, we invested in a business called Well Simple in Canada. So you you have you know th th that's certainly you know an, uh, you know a significant area. The other thing is 
let's not forget the incumbent financial institutions. And many of them want to be more flexible right now. You know, these are these are companies that have really old, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, I think a bunch of them probably still have mainframe systems somewhere in their, you know, in their tech stack, yes. which, are, which are not very, which are not very flexible. So we, we've invested in a class of companies that's helping those incumbents be more dynamic and more flexible when you think about offerings, user interface, you know, things like that. So tons of, 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 uh, you know, opportunities. Um, you know, what I would say is, you know, there, there was a world where, um, you know, everybody was providing lending, you know, your cost of capital was really inexpensive. If, if, if all you were doing was giving money away, you know, now that interest rates have risen, like it's, it's definitely, sh you know, shown um, some limitations of, of, you know, folks' business models, right? You have to provide something more than just, you know, what, what people may think is, um, you know, you know, cheap loans or cheap capital. You have to do something, you know, more than that. So that, you know, I think the the dynamics in the, you know, with interest rates, cost of capital, um, pullback on availability of capital will will have significant impacts on, you know, some of the things that are happening in the uh, in fintech world. But if you just think about the the need to kind of retool infrastructures in banks, in wealth management, in insurance. Like, yeah. it, 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 you know, we're still in the very early innings of, you know, the upgrade of those, of those, you know, um, those, those technology infrastructures. And, you, you know, I'm getting inundated with questions, so I can't ignore them anymore, yeah. but there are several on one theme, which is kind of also a bit of continuation of what you're saying. So I'm going to pick one representing several of them. It says, as an investor, what applications of AI or machine learning excite you the most? Yeah, um, I'm glad we have one. Uh, you know, I always get the AI question. So, <laughs> so, so first of all, um, we, we've looked at a lot of pure play AI, and we have not invested in anything yet. And again, we're growth stage investors, so we're not we're not you know getting in on the in, on the ground floor. Um, some of the things you know, so but we spend a lot of time in AI because the applications of AI are can be pretty material for some of our companies i'll give you a, you know a, a, a few examples and if you step back it's you know making better decisions faster now now this isn't totally about replacing people it's about letting people work you know smarter so you know we have a, a company in the healthcare space um ai doc which has an application that leverages AI, um, you know, for a radiologist. So this is to improve the precision of reading X-rays, you know, CAT scans, MRIs, and things like that. You know, there's always the story. I heard one recently of a, uh, of you know a, um, you know a, a, you know a um, it was either an X-ray or CAT scan that was. Um, misread and, you know, something was missed, which created a problem down the line. Leveraging technology like that to make better decisions. So, you you, you know, your miss rate, um, which, which will happen, your miss rate is a lot lower. Now, has the benefit of, um, you know, probably lowering cost of healthcare, and, and you know, in, in some cases, certainly at scale, and, and provide services for um, communities that, you know, you know, don't have the ability to have a full-time radiologist or, 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 or specialist. So there, there are definitely lots of, lots of benefits, you know, around something like that. You know, we, we also see AI in, you know, some of our other companies that, you know, it, it's as, as simple as, um, you know, you know, call screening, um, we, you know, which is an activity that some, you know, that some go-to-market operations, you know, do. So, you know, again, helping, you know, teams be more efficient by focusing on those things that are more important. And then, you know, consumer applications. And again, I, I love the consumer stuff because that's where I spend most of my time. Hopefully everybody on this call is a, is a Spotify um, user. But if, if you are and you've used their DJ function, DJ function, that, that's literally totally dynamically created, um, you know, uh, 
um, voice. And it is all driven by AI digging into, you know, your history as a, you know, as a listener. So um, I, I think there, you know, there are too many applications of, you know, what AI can do, you know, you know, to even talk about those are three to try to, you know, kind of put, um, you know, some, some con context on, on what the opportunities are, but just think about it as, not only lowering costs, but providing a better experience um, by leveraging the technology. So hopefully that's that, that answered the question. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I'm getting more questions. So clearly you're exciting the curiosity. There's also several questions here about something I wanted to ask you myself, which is really, how do you find the deals? Like here, the servant says, do you often find great deals like Airbnb and Spotify come to you? Or there are particular centers of influence you relied on early on yeah. and currently how yeah. much is based on your network in venture capital i mean how, how do you go about it yeah so i'll, I'll give give some context again on you know where we play which is you know at the growth stage so what we're looking for is kind of some you know um, some material you know commercial activity so it's not it's not pre-revenue you want enough scale that you know you can you can see you know the customers using the product you know the proverbial dogs eating the dog food you you want um you want uh uh you know but well not all companies have to be profitable you want enough um history that you can take a look at um, a business model and say is the core unit of economics is that is the model work right lots of companies are burning cash, I, I think there's a lot of companies that say, oh, we're investing in growth. Many of them are, but there's also many of them that just don't have a business model that works. We want it, we want enough visibility to say, yep, that works. We're gonna, we're gonna spend money to, you know, continue to grow the, you know, the business. So we're so again, we're not, we're not investing in really early stage companies. Now, does not mean that we don't start building our relationship very early. When we make an investment, we've typically known a company for four years. Most of it is us being proactive, right? So we identify areas of interest. We kind of map the world in like what's, what are companies that, you know, fit in this category. Um, you know, somebody mentioned, I think Spotify was in the question, you know, we, we've been Netflix investors for a long time. And, and, you know, one of the themes that Netflix played on was the move, by the way, stepping back, everything that we do is a move from analog to digital. Right, whether it's a consumer or whether it's a business customer, so one of the dynamics there, um, you know, in entertainment was the move from ownership to access. Right, you know, mm -hmm. you could own a DVD, you could own a Betamax tape if you're that old, and and you can watch it, or you can have a you know have access with a service originally with physical media, now streaming online. What are some of the other areas that were interesting? Gaming was one. Music was obviously a big one. We spent time with all of the music services, the, you know, Pandora, which was right across the bay in Oakland, you know, Deezer, uh, Beats Music, and Spotify. And um, we, so we, we, we went to, I remember the first time I went to, you know, Stockholm. And by the way, when we invested in Spotify, it was the third or fourth time that we looked at the business, we knew the company for three and a half years. So they got a sense of how we looked at the world and how we might be helpful. And they got a, we got a sense of like the momentum they had with the business. So, you know, when you've done it long enough and we've been at TCV, been doing it since, you know, 1995, um, you do get things that are inbound, but the vast majority of, of things that we invest in are, you know, companies that, are the expressions of themes that we like, where we've proactively built, you know, um, you know, uh, a relationship. The only other thing that I would say is, since you know I started in the business, you know, and, and at TCV over the last, you know, eight plus years, we we do have a, um, you know, a technology platform that collects, you know, tons of data points, um, you know, from the, you know, from the world, some proprietary, some, you know, you know, you know, normal public, you know, data points. And, and tries to give us, you know, a little bit of a understanding of what, you know, could be a, you know, emerging winner, emerging market leader in a particular space. So, 
you have some context uh, from, you know, which companies to build a relationship with because there's so much activity. Um, and, you know, we're not a, you know, we're a much bigger team than we were when I joined 15 years ago, but you can't do it all. Uh, you can't touch every company, um, you know, by, you know, the quote unquote dialing for dollars and building a relationship. You have to be able to kind of, you know, sort through, um, you know, some of the smaller players and find the ones that you think have an opportunity to be the leaders. Now, you know, there are things like Spotify and Airbnb that, you know, that uh, they show themselves, you know, reasonably early. And, you know, then then those are ones you build, you know, relationships with. But it's a, it, it is still, uh, um, you know, in person, you can still do more Zooms, but, you know, we do a lot of meet and greets, um, uh, you know, tell them who we are, talk about, you know, how we've worked with companies, understand what their goals and, and uh, growth strategies are and see how, you know, we might work together. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Now I'm trying to get some question with big theme. Another one is clearly the elephant in the room because I have so many questions here, which is talking about, uh, you know, given the failure of Silicon Valley Bank or FRB, all the current crisis, what's the effect that you think will have on the VC ecosystem? And I would add on that is also high interest rates. It's, it's a new world. Yeah. Yeah. Look, um, the, no doubt the access to capital is um, significant, has been significantly curtailed and it's more expensive, right? And it's not just, you know, the venture debt opportunity for, you know, emerging companies. It's, it's literally across the board. And well before Silicon Valley Bank, it was, um, you know, just look at the number of, and the, the, the median valuations on series A's and B's and C's and in the growth equity space. You know, at one point, remember, we had a player that came into the market with a hundred billion dollar, you know, fund like the world, you know, went from, you know, this was a cottage industry in many ways, certainly when I started in, you know, 95 and it's been significantly institutionalized. But, you know, there are people trying to do it on this on a scale like, you know, nobody would even, you know, have fathomed it, you know, 10 years before. And now we're we're at a point when um, you know that that access to capital has been you know significantly you know curtailed. Yeah, I think it's great. I actually think it's great. And 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 you know you hear people you know Brian Chesky will talk about um, Airbnb was created in two thousand and eight. You know this is kind of comparable in some ways to two thousand eight. You probably have you know you know I think banks are generally. Um, uh, stronger than they were then. Interest rates were a lot lower back then. But, you know, Brian Chesky talks about the efficiency in which they built their business because there wasn't a ton of capital that was, you know, that was available. So I, th I think uh, great ideas, there's always funding for great ideas. By the way, there's always funding for growth companies. It's just people have to, may have to change their valuation mindset. And I think that's, you know, one of the probably the big, you know, resets that, uh, that some companies are going to have to go through. And I think a lot of people have made that leap, but, you know, before when people would be opportunistic about raising more capital because the prices were so attractive, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, now, now you don't have, you're not looking to be opportunistic. Now, I think you will see more activity with, you know, there hasn't been a lot of liquidity for, you know, many, many uh, venture participants, I, I don't think people will sell 100% of their stakes, but their people may look to sell partial stakes in companies. I think the opportunity to do really a creative, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions, you know, is, is going to be interesting. And that may be a driver of, of some new activity, but no question, you know, now is a is certainly a different time. And, and, and the thing that, you know, we tell all our companies and, and even companies that we're, we're talking to is, you, you know, and, and we've always believed this, by the way, but you, you have to be do, doing something that's important, right? You know, there's a lot of companies that got funded that might be nice to haves versus need to haves, right? You know, the seventh player in a particular market, like those are really tough to get financed now. But if you have a great idea that solves a real problem, and you're approaching it in a really thoughtful way, 
here's money for you. By the way, it might not be at the same multiples that, you know, that, that, that transactions got done 24 months ago, but it certainly may be consistent to what they were done five or six or seven years ago. And I think the point is, if you believe in your idea, play the long game, you know, raise money. By the way, you don't have to raise three times what you think you need. Be efficient, build a, you know, a great business that's providing real value for your customers. And you're going to be, you know, really well positioned. But it is a, it is a, it is a different environment today. And, and by the way, some people have had to, you know, it's been a, you know, it's been a, a, a big lesson and eye-opening experience for them because you're talking about many um, executives and founders that popped into the world after the, you know, the blow up of 2008. So they've only seen one environment and now it's, you know, it's a little bit different. I, you know, some of us, me, I, you know, I went through, you know, 2000 to 2002, I went through, you know, 98 to uh, 2008 to, you know, 2000 and, 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 and 10, I, you know, I've gone through COVID. I'm going through this right now. Like, you know, in many ways, in many ways, um, it's about focusing on quality and, and, and being, you know, being efficient with, uh, um, with, uh, you know, how you're going to approach the world and spending money and scaling your business. That's, that's incredibly interesting. And actually there was a related question. I mean, it kind of, a, it, it, you were saying as a startup, you want to look on the long run, but there was also a question, is, is there any specific action a startup to launch a raise fund that could do in this more difficult environment? I mean, I think there are deals that are getting done. The question is, what's the problem that you're solving, right? Yeah. It's, 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 not, it's not like the problems have gone away. It's not like, you know, you know, the famous quote by Mark Andreessen of software eating the world. It, it's not like, it's not like we're going back to paper. You know, I had a, I had a, a limited partner that didn't focus on technology asked me, you know, recently, like, do you think technology is a good place to be? And I was, my thought was, I don't know. I, I mean, are you buying CDs or DVDs? Like, no, we're, I mean, we're not going back. But the, the point is, what's the problem that you're solving? I see. So, I see. so I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big believer that you know, if, if you're focusing on something that is, you know, meaningful and you're approaching it in a thoughtful way, there's, there's funding for you. By the way, I, I'm waiting for the, you know, last year, 2022 was the worst year for uh, tech IPOs. Worst ever. I think this could be a more interesting year. It's just people have to reset their valuation expectations. And the problem that, that you have is people have raised money at high prices, and now they have to, you know, kind of have a, a, you know, a reset of that expectation. My only point is the only thing that determines your ultimate valuation is how you execute. So, you know, let's put the ball in play and go play. That's Exactly. I completely, I completely agree. I completely agree. And talking about, you know, you, you're touching so many interesting areas and you mentioned before a little bit also healthcare, right? That's another, your recent team you has adopted is digital health platform, which is exploding and you touched a little bit, but there yeah. are so many inefficiencies health in healthcare delivery. What gaps are the most attractive to TCV? Oh, there, there's, there's, I mean, there's many. So let's break it into um, a couple of ways. So like, first of all, you have the consumer and, you know, there are going to be things where you're helping empower the consumer, right? Let, let the individual be more of a party to their, to managing their healthcare, right? So what are, what are those solutions look like? Is it information? Is it, you know, it's tools, you know, you have, uh, you know, health savings accounts, high deducted, uh, deductible um, insurance plans and things like that, which, which kind of, you know, put the risk sharing in, 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 the, in the hands of the, the consumer. And then you look at, you know, just the entire services space and you have, you know, providers and you have insurers and what, 
you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, find areas where technology can impact outcomes. And the outcomes in some cases are quality of care. By the way, I think quality of care should be, you know, front and center across the board. But the other part of it is, you know, is, you know, how do we, how does the industry spend money more efficiently, right? And, you know, you still have, um, you know, there are parts of the ecosystem that are, that, you know, again, that move from analog to digital is, hasn't happened yet, right? You know, not all areas of healthcare are, you know, tech forward, right? So a lot of them could be systems, right? Um, you know, we, we have a, we have a company that, you know, that is, you know, working in an area that's unfortunately a growth area, which is addiction clinics. And it's how, how allowing, you know, this specialized um, set of, um, of practitioners manage their business, you know, more effectively, right? So how do you lower the cost of care? How do you, how do you improve the quality outcomes, you know, for, you know, you know, for your, you know, you know your patients. So th those are like from a high level, it's how do you do the business of healthcare quicker, cheaper, but more effective, effective being, you know, the outcomes. And, and a lot of it is, you know, again, you know, this, it's not, you know, this has been a statement that's been true for, you know, since as long as I've been investing, which is if you can help somebody identify a problem well before it happens, you, you know, you're, it's a lot cheaper to get it dealt with at your general practitioner than the emergency room. So the question is, how do you provide more transparency to people's health, both for the individual and then their practice, their practitioners? And if they're, if they're with a company, some, you know, again, many companies are self-insured on the, you know, on the healthcare side, give them the tools to manage their populations. So it, I, I think we're in the very early stages of, um, you know, advancements in some of these areas. And it's not just physical health, it's mental health. So, you know, it's a, it's, it is literally one of the most massive opportunities that we have in, in, in front of us. And I think, uh, you know, many, many different uh, applications of technology are, you know, kind of no brainers. And, and they, these are ones where if you find that problem, and I said before, are you doing something that's meaningful and impactful? You know, the answer here for healthcare is absolutely. So interesting. And there's so many questions here also about how do you pivot? How do you enter the venture capital world? Which I'm not surprised because, as I said, that's what we see. And interesting here, I have two questions. One is from an incoming first year student, uh, hello, uh, student uh, asking, how do you pivot into venture capital from a background in consulting a startup? And then there's another question from instead an alum with a long experience in an industry, in that case, clean tech and say, how can you use a long experience in the industry to enter venture capital? So the two yeah. extreme about yeah. that. Yeah, again, I go back to my, you know, to, to my story, which, and I, I, I know this isn't helpful, which is, you know, it's in many ways, it's hard to plan, right? It's so, you know, to, you know, to me, and by the way, I was, this was not where I was looking to go, right? The opportunity popped up. I was like, oh, wow, this would be a great place for me to see lots of emerging companies that I could go, you know, you know, work at. And um, that was, you know, almost 30 years ago. So, you know, um, opportunist, uh, you know, when opportunity knocks, you answer the door, right? That, 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 as that saying goes, but, you know, I think my, my, point of view would be, um, you know, first of all, there, you know, technology is not the only area of venture capital. There's, you know, consumer, there's lots of other areas. Um, you know, as somebody said, clean tech. So clean tech is very different than IT is very different than healthcare. Um, you know, there's, you know, very different than some parts of consumer, like whatever area that you're interested in, like there's lots of ways to get involved. I, I, I think, becoming an expert as quickly as you can, you know, will give you opportunities. By the way, you may also realize that, you know what, it's more fun to, to be an operator and work at multiple companies and advise companies at the same time, as opposed to, you know, being on the, you know, the, the venture side where you're, you know, coach slash 
you know, bystander, you know, trying not to get in the way. Um, so you can be a little more proactive in some of those in some of those cases. So to me, whatever's in interest of yours, you know, keep pursuing it. The opportunity may, you know, pop up, take advantage of it. Yeah, you know, there there are um, uh, some of the growth equity firms, you know, you know, do some recruiting at, at, at schools, certainly the buyout firms and many of the buyout firms have growth initiatives. You know, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to go to a little company where they give you enough rope to, you know, be a cowboy or hang yourself? Or do you want to be, you know, part of a really broad team and your responsibility set may feel like it did at consulting or, you know, investment banking? So, I, again, I, I think figure out what are the things that are most interesting to you. If it's a stage, it's a it's a sector, you know, um, there's a geography that you think is really interesting, Europe, Latin America, et cetera. <clears throat> Focus on that, become an expert there. The, the opportunity over time will arise. You'll, you'll see it if you become, you know, really embedded in, in, in you know, in those areas. I, I do think it's, you know, harder, certainly not impossible, but it's harder, you know, to, you know, to go in the front door of a big, well-established firm. If you do, you may be part of a, you may, may have more of a support role which may be fine, but I, I think there are trade-offs that you have to consider depending on what your interests are or are not. That's, that's a great advice. And for people who want to be entrepreneur, there is a question right, for, that I wanted to ask you, which is how valuable is to you a founder with a successful uh, track record? Are there entrepreneurs that if they, kill, if they call you, you're gonna pick right away, right? It's like, how do you go? Abs up? By the way, absolutely. You know, as, as I would say, TCB does not do Series A. We do have a um, we have an ex a velocity fund now that does expansion. We did a Series A of Zillow because we made almost a billion dollars with um, uh, with Rich Barton, the CEO of Expedia, who then founded yeah. um, founded Zillow. So, you know. We don't do Series A, but if Rich Barton's going to start a company, we do Series A. So, you know, there are folks that, that are like that. But, uh, you know, it, I, you know, you love people that have, have, have been, um, I like the uh, brother-in-law who's a Navy pilot who speaks in acronyms. One of them is BTDT, been there, done that. So you want somebody that's had that experience. But success is interesting, but it's not always the most critical thing. Um, I love uh, entrepreneurs that have failed because a they, they you know they have a chip on their shoulder they have a burning desire and they tend to know how to deal with excuse my French with some shit right like if if all you've done is everything was up and to the right like if you, by the way when COVID hit if you were an up and to the right person you you know you got a lesson you know where where you may have to go to you know school again so. You know, to, to me, I'm more interested in the experience around, have you operated in growth at scale? Like, um, what's, what's your management style? How are you at hiring people? You know, and management style is not, you know, just the smartest person in the room, but, you know, do you have leadership qualities? You know, uh, empowering people, empathy. You know, these, these are, um, you know, these are, these are character um, traits that are going to be remarkably uh, important, especially if a company hits a tough time. You know, it, it, companies that don't have great cultures, when you know the road gets rough, people walk out the door. They 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 may not be true believers. They may be mercenaries that thought they were just in it for you know to make a buck. That's when the world changes. That's a that that that's not you know that doesn't have great you know staying power. So yeah, I, I love successful. Um, entrepreneurs, but I like I like people that have been in the the battle that have done things. You know, growth at scale for us is important just because we're at the growth stage, and I think it's a different skill set to go from you know zero to ten million or zero to fifty million than fifty million to five hundred million or a hundred million to a billion. So, kind of depends what you're looking for. But success is always you know helpful. Um, but to me, it's more, you know, the, the, the quantum of the experience and the specifics around that. 
Well, I, I, I love your reference to leadership because as you know, you know, Kellogg has a lot of focus yep. on leadership and it's people like you. I see that this has been picked up in several questions asking really one says, can you elaborate on your strategy for leading teams through challenging times or the present environment? Yeah, I mean, look, our, our great, so again, as an investor, what you're looking for, you know, I think the, the most critical thing to me is, you know, what's the, what's the team that's leading, you know, what you think is a differentiated product, um, you know, in a big market. And, um, you know, I think there, there are things that, you know, I think great leaders do. There's a lot of clarity. Um, you know, everybody knows the, you know, knows the mission. Um, people feel, you know, part of the, you know, you know, part of the journey. Um, but, you know, you also as a leader, you know, sometimes have to make really difficult decisions. And I think that's the, the toughest one. You know, when I was younger in this, really young in this space, I remember a, a, a savvy executive that had been around the block before telling me, you know, uh, what, if we're talking, if a board or management team is talking about a particular issue, maybe it's changing out an executive, maybe it's a business line, a strategy, you already know what the answer is, but you, but you have to be, um, you know, you have to be aggressive and do it, right? Um, you know, I'll give you a, a perfect example. You know, in, in 2011, Netflix um, announced that they were going to uh, start charging for stream, streaming and then, and then split the business up into the, the DVD business and the streaming business. And so if you, if you like both products, you all of a sudden had an 80% increase in your price and, and the world went, like customers went, you know, bananas. And a business that was gr growing so fast was losing customers. There was so much um, anger and, and, and negativity directed at the company uh, from a company that had, you know, brand, you know, you know, love. And they, and, and they uh, you know, Reed Hastings, the CEO, acknowledged, you know, the mistake. They changed, you know, they changed that. By the way, you know, since then, they've grandfathered people for a year to two years on any pricing changes. But, and, and, and by the way, that was a, that was a good lesson in, you know, in, in kind of crisis management. But, you know, one of the ways that I thought about it, we were investors, um, and became bigger investors during that time, which was which was which was uh, you know an opportunity. But the reason that Reed was doing that was he believed correctly that over time the DVD business had no value, real value, with the ultimate value of the business. And any time that you know the team was spending on that was was wasted. So whether you know in hindsight it was practical or not practical the way that they did it. That was a very tough decision that I think showed a level of focus on where the company was going that you don't see all the time. And by the way, many people will look at that as like, you know, I remember, I think at the end of the year, it was like some, some you know, report somewhere, some blogger, some periodical was like the five biggest bonehead moves of the, of the year, and they put it in that category. I, and I still, to this day, think that, and, I, and by the way, I think Reed is, you know, is one of the, he is a really very unique, you know, leader. You look at the team that he's built, the culture that he's built, you know, read his book, books, you know, like, you know, maybe it was a bonehead thing because of the reaction, but what actually it showed was, in my mind, was the clarity of, of thought of where he was going and, and him trying to optimize, um, you know, that for, you know, you know, for the success of the organization. So le leadership is, leadership is hard. Um, and, you know, it's certainly, I think everybody's been tested in a pretty significant way, you know, uh, Certainly since two thousand and eight, but more recently since you know since COVID, and and um, uh, it's it, it's it's one of the reasons. There's some folks that will invest in it. They say I'll invest in a business that's in a market so big a management team can't get in the way of its success. Yeah, I like markets like that, but I'm I'm a 
I'm, I like the jockey. Like besides the horse, I like to, to bet on the jockey. I love that. I love that. I'm seeing time flies away, so I don't want to let you go without asking you a question about uh, Kellogg, which is kind of related about what you were saying about the jockey, right? It's like, when you look back at your experience at Kellogg, what did you learn from your classmates, teammates has been most valuable to you? You know, it's a really good question. Um, I remember taking it, you know, my last semester, I wrote a case and I, I took this uh, seminar from Professor Robertson, who um, was a, you know, ex-military guy. I think he worked at Goldman Sachs. And I remember um, he had, a, he had a, a, a top 10 list. I, only, I remember a few of them, but I remember, you know, number one was um, shut the F up and listen. And um, I, I think to me, one of the things that I think is the most important thing is you learn a lot and it's, and it's great, you know, foundational, you know, um, you know, training so you can approach problems in a, you know, in a structured way. But I think one of the biggest things that I think it did for me was gave me the, you know, confidence to ask, always ask questions. Um, because I think there are times earlier in my career where I would, you know, I wanted to ask a question, but I would think to myself, should I know that? Like, I don't know if I should know that. And I was, you know, after two years at Kellogg, it's like, all right, I'm at a top business school. I'm doing all this work. I've done all this stuff. I've met all these people with all these professors and everything. It's like the worst thing that you can do is not ask the question. And a lot of times people don't ask the questions, right? Because sometimes, it actually is simple. You know, I, I look at companies that blow up sometimes because of communication or things like that. And you, and you would say from the outside, if you were, if you were impartial, um, you know, just an impartial bystander, like that makes no sense to me, but you have to get into it to understand, you know, you have all the emotion and everything. Sometimes you miss something that's simple. So, so to me, like, you know, business is not, this is not rocket science. Right. By the way, there is rocket science. You can get into that business. Like, you know, I didn't I didn't invest in SpaceX because that is rocket science. By the way, many people invested it because, they, you know, they, they believed in, you know, Elon. But I think the point is it could be that simple, but you have to ask the questions. And, you know, to me, you should have that confidence after being a Kellogg that you're not asking a you know stupid question. And then overlay that with, you know, the framework on how you're, you know, at, you know, answering some of the important questions. And yes, Kellogg um, can skew to the teamwork and leadership and things like that. And, and again, I think, you know, whether you're at a company, whether you're investing in companies, whether you're advising companies, like to me, that's a critical thing. You know, if you if you don't believe that there's the culture, you know, that I mean, all, all the great companies you know, many of them have leaders like the Reed Hastings of the world, but like what, one of the things that he's done is, is created this culture of innovation. And if you want to invest in technology, you better have that, right? You bet. And, and by the way, the only way that you have that is if people feel safe, there's lots of transparency, you know, the, the, you know, reward system is there, you know, all of those things are all that organizational behavior that like, I remember, taking some of those and thinking to myself, oh my God, like, what am I doing? When's my, when's my, you know, when's my, you know, finance class so I can, you know, dig into something meaty or my new products class. And it's like, the, the, you know, the culture is the thing that's, that, that I think um, determines more about the success of a, any company, whether you're an investor or advisor than anything else. So I think that's how, I, that's how I would answer that question. That is an amazing answer and it's a true Kellogg answer. So thank you for that. I mean, we are at time. I can't believe the time flew. I have still, I apologize to all the question I didn't pick up because I didn't have enough time. It's been amazing really and so inspirational. And I have 100 more questions myself, but that is what we learn by listening to someone like you. Thank all you right. so much. We'll do, that. we'll do that same for the next time. Exactly, exactly. With more things happening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank bye you. bye. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you.